Welcome uh, to the NYU Langone Orthopedic Webinar Series. My name is Omri Ailan I'm from the Division of Hand Surgery here. Um, we're excited about our CME event tonight that is entitled Expert Orthopedic Management of the Elbow Beyond the Trauma. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is meant to be a high yield and clinically oriented um, talk and to spark, spark debate. It's meant to be interactive, um, and obviously in the age of COVID, it's very different than how we initially intended it. However, um, hopefully you can, uh, you can participate as much as or, or as little as you'd like. Um, feel free to type questions into the, uh, the chat bar, and we're going to get to uh, questions and some debate uh, at the end of, uh, of the program. Um, with respect to the CME credit, just um, make sure you go to the CME website that you use to register for the course, and there'll be instructions on how to download the, uh, the credit for, uh, for this course. Um, all right, let's just jump in. Um, I'm excited about our talks today. Um, I'm going to kick us off here. Treating the elbow can definitely be challenging, and so we're addressing topics that are commonly encountered but may sometimes present diagnostic and therapeutic uh, challenges. Um, so I'm going to be uh, talking about the, the, I'm going to be doing the introduction uh, talk, talking about the relevant anatomy and some useful surgical approaches when treating the elbow. So I have no disclosures. This is the, the fist bump of, uh, of the COVID times in 2020, 2021. So I'll try to keep this portion of the presentation high yield as our audience may, uh, is mainly composed of surgeons. I know there's some physical therapists as well. Um, and we'll get to what structures are violated in this particular elbow, which obviously there's a lot going on, and we'll talk about that. So the elbow is one of the most highly constrained joints in the body, and the goal of the elbow or the purpose of the elbow is to place the hand in space, and there is a delicate balance, and <clears throat> when this balance is off, the joint can trend towards uh, both instability and contracture, which is uh, pretty interesting, and we'll talk about why. All right, so in terms of the bony structures of the elbow, there's three bones and there's three joints, and we'll get to all of them. So at the trochlea um, of, of the humerus, there's 300 degrees of articular cartilage, um, which is pretty unique. Uh, the coronoid and olecranon fossa uh, accept their respective processes to increase their bony stability, and Dr. Verk will be talking a little bit more about that coming up here. So in terms of uh, the humerus side of things, I want you to note how distal the medial aspect of the trochlea extends. And that's important to remember, especially when you're reconstructing, reconstructing those uh, comminuted distal humerus fractures, you're reconstructing that spool. And so uh, there's a range of valgus carrying angle that is physiologic and varies within the population. Um, as well as this is, this is also an important uh, anatomic relationship to remember that there's a 30 degree of anterior tilt that allows motion. And this is matched perfectly with the ulna, um, which is the stable base of the forearm. So that anterior tilt that we were talking about of the distal humerus is matched reciprocally with the posterior tilt of the semilunar notch of the ulna. As you can see by the fact that the coronoid tip is uh, more proximal than the olecranon tip. And so that is a, a bony buttress to prevent posterior subluxation of the joint. So the actual anatomy of the joint, of the ulnohumeral joint, it's been, it's been described as a loose hinge and some useful external landmarks that you can use for the center of rotation that's important in surgery of the elbow um, is the anterior inferior aspect of the medial epicondyle and the center of the arc of the capitellum. However, this is a moving target, meaning it does change through the arc of motion, uh, inflection and extension. And so some describe it as a screw displacement axis that actually changes, like we said, uh, throughout the arc of motion. And this, this anatomical facts, fact makes it difficult to recreate or reproduce with implants and um, arthroplasties. And that's why there's uh, been a trend towards dynamic X fixes, which we'll get to later. All right, let's talk about the ligamentous anatomy um, of the elbow. So essentially, they're just capsular thickenings. Um, but the anterior capsule is an often forgotten structure, but it is a real structure. The fibers are arranged in a transverse and a radial orientation. They attach at the tip of the coronoid, 
um, and they do contribute to stability of the elbow, especially in extension. Um, and I can't stress this enough, especially in those terrible triad injuries and instability cases. This is a big contributor to stability. On the medial side of the elbow, <clears throat> um, there's three uh, ligaments, the anterior oblique, the posterior oblique, and the transverse uh, ligament. Okay, the anterior ligament, anterior oblique ligament is the strongest and it's the most significant stabilizer to valgus stress in the elbow. Um, it runs from the antero inferior ridge on the medial epicondyle, as you can see here, to a point roughly three millimeters distal to the ulna articular mar margin on the sublime tubercle. This anterior oblique uh, ligament is subdivided into two bands, the anterior and posterior. And the anterior, what I want you to know about the anterior is that that's the one that's isometric throughout the arc of, of motion. Okay, the posterior oblique um, is more of a triangular ligament and it's tighter in flexion, it's shaped like a fan and it inserts along the greater sigmoid notch. All right, so moving to the radius, the head and the neck of the radius is in uh, 15 degrees of valgus. And that's important to remember when you're fixing and replacing this. Um, in the graphic, this graphic here, you can see that in cross section, the head of the radius is not a perfect circle, it's elliptical. Um, and so that means that the center of rotation um, that coincides with the center of the neck is not the center of the head. So with progressive forearm pronation, as you move down uh, on this diagram, the center translates radially, which then has implications in stability. And then with respect to the forearm axis of rotation, it's important to remember that it runs from a point center of the radial head to the ulnar fovea at the wrist. Now moving to the lateral side of the elbow, the annular ligament attaches uh, to the anterior and posterior margins of the lesser sigmoid notch, and it holds the radius to the ulna. The radial collateral ligament is sort of a bl blends in with the annular ligament and stabilizes the radial head. This one is uniformly taut through the flexion, uh, flexion arc. And then the LUCL, which we commonly think about, inserts on the supinator crest of the ulna, and that's stable also throughout a full arc of motion and does play a significant role in uh, dislocation. And I think of it like a, a posterior sling uh, of the radial head that comes into play when you're approaching this. So this case that I showed earlier, basically all the lateral ligamentous uh, components, the, the RCL, the annular, the LUCL were, were uh, necessarily ruptured to allow this sort of injury. And so those ligaments all needed to be addressed in performing surgery, in addition to aligning the, the, skeleton, the, the skeletal anatomy. All right, so let's move on to some useful surgical approaches. And so now you're using the, the knowledge of the anatomy that we just went through, and you can kind of plan which, which approach is best for the procedure. And um, like I said, our audience is composed mostly of surgeons, so I'm gonna try to keep it high yield. So on the posterior uh, side of the elbow, these approaches can be extensile, and you can even access the medial and the lateral side of the elbow through just a simple posterior skin incision. And that's important because actually fewer cutaneous nerves are violated when you use a midline posterior uh, approach. And obviously triceps management is the main concern and is the block to visualization here. So just a couple points about um, using uh, an electron osteotomy. You wanna come out at the bare area um, of the ulna, ulno, ulnotrochial joint. Um, paratricipital approaches um, is great to mobilize the medial and lateral gutters, um, and you can fix the bulk of distal humerus fractures, and there's less post-operative restrictions because you're not really violating the extensor mechanism. So now what to do with the triceps? You can split it. This is the tricep split, which is really a workhorse approach for humeral shaft, distal humerus fractures. It can get bloody, and so I would have a low threshold to consider using a drain after surgery. Um, after a triceps split, I rarely protect the triceps um, in terms of uh, postoperative restrictions. The triceps reflecting approach isn't as commonly done anymore, but you're actually elevating the entire extensor mechanism off of the ulna, and you definitely need to limit their active extension for six weeks after surgery, um, after their repair. The Brian Mori approach I included also, it's basically just the medial portion of the triceps reflecting, and this is a good in-between option. On the lateral side of the elbow, 
I'll spare you sort of the nitty gritty. I mean, I know most of you all know the the uh, the Coker and the Kaplan approaches. Um, I do prefer the Kaplan approach. It's more anterior. The interval is between the EDC and the wrist extensors. Um, it avoids the, the, the LUCL because it is more anterior. And basically, if you stay anterior to the equator of the radial head, you're basically safe. Always remember that you have to protect the PIN by pronating the forearm. And then extending this incision proximally, uh, the lateral column approach um, is really great uh, for fractures or uh, for exposing the anterior capsule to do capsulectomies, uh, heterotopic ossification uh, cases as well. So on the medial side of the elbow, there's obviously lots of different ways to approach it, but my approach of choice for the medial elbow is the FCU split. I feel like as hand surgeons, uh, we're very comfortable around the ulnar nerve. And so the approach is just the distal extent of that. You basically follow the ulnar nerve um, through the two heads of the FCU and you work anterior, mobilizing uh, the flexor pronator mass off of the coronoid and you get really great visualization into the joint and on the coronoid. There's no trouble with putting a, a large buttress plate if you need it for those um, intermedial fragments. You can see here the, uh, the medial collateral ligament as well. So uh, summarizing, basically, this, this joint is an interesting combination of trending towards constraint and contracture. And then obviously you're going to use uh, the anatomy that we uh, just talked about uh, to plan your surgical approaches. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to move to our next speaker. <clears throat> so, so right now I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Nader Paksima. Um, he is clinical professor of orthopedics in the division of hand surgery here at NYU. And he's the associate chief of the NYU uh, hand service. And he is going to be talking to us about managing the stiff and arthritic elbow and having realistic surgical solutions. Dr. Paxima, take it away. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Omri. That was a, that was a great introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk about the managing the stiff uh, elbow. These are my disclosures. And the elbow, um, very useful in all kinds of things uh, when you're using a hammer and anvil or even also for striking. But we're gonna talk about the stiff elbow and um, three things I wanted to concentrate on, which is post-traumatic hydrotopic ossification, uh, synostosis, as we, we typically see from these traumatic injuries like this uh, fracture dislocation of the elbow. And a minority of cases are from arthritis, like we see over here with the typical anterior and posterior uh, heterotopic bone formation. Elbow contractures can be from soft tissue or bony causes, such as capsular contraction, uh, electrical or thermal burns, um, muscle tendon unit tightness like the triceps, uh, or even hematomas in the brachialis, to show a case of that, and uh, infection. And from bony things like heterotopic bone uh, and problems in the joint like arthrogryposis and calcification of the uh, ligaments. Now, HO is different than periarticular calcification in that periarticular calcification may not turn into organized lamellar bone, but it's just calcification in the ligaments. Uh, whereas heterotopic bone or myositis specificans has three distinct histologic zones, a cellular center, a second layer of osteoid, a more peripheral um, organized bone. It comes from undifferentiated mesenchymal cells that are uh, modulated by these types of um, uh, hormones. And in the laboratory assessment, we can look at ALKFOS levels elevations of protein and a, a transient decrease in serum calcium. These really aren't practically useful. The last two are just most, more for, for research. Uh, radiographs uh, lag behind, so you may develop HO, but it won't show up for about four to six weeks. You can, initial radiographs can miss it. Uh, bone scans are traditionally used to identify if the HO is mature. And so the idea was to have a cold bone scan, but uh, really it's turned out that delaying the excision of heterotopic bone until of a cold bone scan is not necessary. So the traditional idea was to wait 18 to 24 months, have a cold bone scan and a low ALKFOS level before you consider resection. HO can be classified as class one with no functional limit. Class two is either in the flexion extension plane, supination pronation, or 2C is in both planes. And class three is ankylosis. And obviously ankylosis in one plane is better than in both. 
Um, I like to think of HO by location. Where is it located? Is it anterior? Is it posterior? Um, and so here's a case example. Here's a, a fracture dislocation of the elbow. Uh, this is a few years back, treated with a hinged elbow compass hinge, uh, a radial head arthroplasty, repair of the medial collateral ligament, and a coronoid suture repair. And at one year follow-up, we see the classic anterior HO around the coronoid and brachialis, as well as here we have medial, lateral, and posterior uh, components to the HO. And that's, and that's where it forms. Um, once HO has formed, the only treatment is really surgical excision. So we're talking about um, going in and removing it. And luckily, whatever HO forms in the anterior column, the lateral column, and the posterior column can usually be excised from one incision. And rarely do we have to go after medial HO. So here's the lateral approach. Essentially, with a lateral approach coming along the lateral column, you can go anteriorly, excise the anterior capsule. You can remove the coronoid. Uh, you can get the posterior and remove the posterior capsule and even remove any olecranon osteophytes. In this diagram, the authors show a technique of going anterior and posterior and preserving the uh, common extensor tendon and the lateral ulna collateral ligament um, and doing a, essentially a, a column type procedure by saving the collateral ligaments. I rarely do it this way. I, I prefer to take everything down and then um, I get a much better exposure and the downside is potential instability, but I've never seen a case of instability after HO resection. So let's look at some cases. So this, the rest of the talk is gonna be essentially case-based. And this is a case where I had a patient with capsule contraction, but no real HO. She's a 53 year old homemaker. The range of motion is from 30 degree extension deficit to 80 degrees of, of flexion for about a 50 degree arc. So these pictures are taken with me standing in the armpit and the photographs are taken from the head down. So you're looking at the lateral side of the elbow. So this is a lateral approach and the lateral approach comes along the supracondylar ridge as Omri showed earlier, and you go down the coker interval. So it's along the supracondylar ridge, down the coker interval. The purple dot is the origin of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. And by taking this down, now you have access to the anterior capsule. You can get to the coronoid, the coronoid fossa. And by going posteriorly um, with the LUCL gone, you can subluxate the elbow, get to the tip of the uh, olecranon and olecranon fossa. Here's the range of motion post-release with the restoration of full extension and full flexion. Now this is intra-op obviously, and you, uh, I always warn the patients that they're not gonna keep everything that we gain in surgery, but if you can gain a little more than half of it and keep a little more than half of it, then it's typically worthwhile. Another case, this is a stiff elbow, post elbow dislocation with heterotopic bone this time. Here's the range of motion intraoperatively. Uh, this is uh, after the induction of anesthesia and after a block. Um, and I always think it's important to do an exam under anesthesia after you've had adequate uh, block with either infraclavicular block or with general anesthesia to see if your preoperative range of motion changes any. So here you can see that there's limited range of flexion and extension, and there's also limited pronation, full supination, but limited pronation. And this is where the HO is. It's anterior, it's a little bit posterior, and it's a little bit lateral. So I'm gonna target here the proximal radial joint to restore the rotation, go lateral and get the anterior stuff and get the posterior stuff. And here's how it looks surgically. This is the lateral approach. You can see the outline of the radial head drawn out here. Uh, the heterotopic bone is removed. This is a, a trial for the radial head arthroplasty after excision of the radial head to restore PRUJ motion. And here's the implant in place. So now we, we can see we have the, the full supination and full pronation as well as extension and flexion has been uh, restored. Another case, this time in pure anterior HO, this is a 21 year old female. She had a traumatic brain injury and developed this large uh, heterotopic bone right in the uh, front of the elbow, right in the brachialis. And this was really limiting her range of motion, which is about a 20 or 30 degree arc of motion here between extension and flexion, even on the, under anesthesia. So this time when, when that, HO is medial, the lateral approach won't work. So here we're going to do the, the medial approach <coughs> that Dr. Eilon was, was talking about. Uh, this is a, a slightly more proximal approach. And basically, I start with identifying the ulnar nerve and uh, protecting it, transposing it, and uh, then identifying the median nerve 
And then uh, here's the brachial artery with a vessel loop. And once those nerves and arteries have been exposed and protected, then um, it's a safer approach to get to the heterotopic bone, isolate it, expose it, and excise it. So here's the heterotopic bone that was in the x-ray and it's been excised. And uh, that led to a restoration of great flexion, but not full extension, but that was, it was adequate. And she was able to maintain most of that arc. Another uh, example of a, me a more medial problem is hematoma in the uh, brachialis. This is a young lady, she went snowboarding, she hit a tree and had an isolated injury to the elbow. The presenting uh, problem was numbness in the hand. Within a few days, there was a bulge in, in the anterior aspect of her uh, elbow. Um, X-rays didn't really show it because X-rays aren't gonna show heterotopic bone formation in the first few days. Um, here's her MRI showing this very discrete mass in the anterior aspect of the elbow. And um, <clears throat> the question was, in this case, should we wait for this HO to mature a little bit and really form and, and declare itself on x-rays or go in right away? And um, in this particular case, because of the ongoing median nerve problems, that forced my hand into having to go in right away. But I was really worried that, I, that am I going to go in too early? So here's what it looks like just a few days later, a week after her injury. You can see the outline of where the mass was. And the approach was done through an anterior medial approach with a release of the Lacertus and then identification of the median nerve and brachial artery and then removal of this <clears throat> um, mass that was in the brachialis. And this was, this was not a hematoma, it wasn't liquid. It was a solid rubbery thing that was on its way to becoming HO. Uh, before it had calcified. And the, the big concern was that is this going to now, because it's been resected so early, um, be an incomplete resection or cause a recurrence. Um, but fortunately, she was able to maintain her full range of motion and have a resolution of the median nerve symptoms. So that's the fastest I've taken on HO is in seven days. We used to wait two years. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about elbow arthritis. Typically, the patient that you see is about a 50-year-old male, either a heavy weightlifter or a heavy laborer, especially the jackhammer use. And the um, pattern of arthritis is around the coronoid and the olecranon fossa. Um, the elbow is not typically a joint that develops arthritis because it's not usually a weight-bearing joint unless you're doing heavy lifting. The pathology is thickening of the anterior capsule, posterior capsule as well and osteophyte formation in the coronoid and olecranon fossa, which limits the range of motion. So my favorite procedure for this is the outer bridge uh, Kashiwagi and the OK procedure is, is great. I'm not a elbow scope person, so this, this is not my case, but uh, you can certainly do this arthroscopically. This is probably the one thing I would consider doing arthroscopically uh, because it's a, it's a clean shot. So you have a posterior portal, which has no dangers, posterior lateral portal, also no dangers. And you can use one to view and one to burr, and you can get a nice shot from posterior to anterior. And if you want to add a third portal anterolateral, you can do that to excise some capsule. I generally do this open. So here's, I, I, I'll use a two inch incision. You split the triceps uh, and uh, get right down to the posterior capsule, excise the capsule. And then you can use a K wire to identify the olecranon and coronoid fossa, which usually is a thin membrane of bone. It's usually super thin here in these cases it becomes thickened and then you can use the trefline to remove the um, area of bone and you've got the k-wire in it so it pops out like an olive and then it gives you a nice hole to work in where you can go anteriorly and do what you need to do to release anterior so generally i'll use a thin stiletto osteotome uh, and go in there and knock off the tip of the coronoid and then a pituitary rongeur to retrieve the piece of coronoid and release any anterior capsule um, and you can get them moving right away with that tricep split. Typically post-operatively, I'll put them in a splint that keeps the elbow in extension. I'm gonna leave the rehab talks for Dr. Catalano, but uh, this is my one rehab slide, which is post-release extension of the elbow because getting flexion back is much easier and it's easier to elevate the arm when it's extended. Here, here's a, a case example. It's kind of a unique case. This gentleman came to see me. This is his elbow extension. And this is flexion. So you can see here's the extension, here's the flexion, which is pretty good actually. But his chief complaint was not being able to reach his collar. He was a priest and he needed to adjust his collar. 
And so um, he wanted just a few more degrees of flexion. So I took a look at his arm and he's got this forearm rotation, but really caught my eye was this big bulge in the back of his elbow. And here's what the x-rays look like. So he had had a humeral shaft fracture and had been treated with a long arm cast and fracture went on to heal, um, but he had a stiff elbow. So he had a secondary surgery and as part of the elbow release, somebody removed most of his olecranon. So this is, the, why, why isn't this joint dislocated? What's holding this thing together? Well, the origin and insertion of the medial collateral ligament were still preserved. So uh, he still had the, the supernator, I'm sorry, he still had the uh, sublime tubercle here. And so he was able to maintain the stability of the, uh, the elbow. And he really needed this coronoid knocked off, but I was afraid to go in the front and disrupt any stability he had. So uh, we thought about what are, what are his treatment options. And uh, my idea was to go in from the back with the okay procedure, split the triceps again, use the trephine. Here's the trephine being used uh, with the K-wire holes. And um, once that coronoid fossa had been removed, then there was room to receive that, that enlarged, enlarged coronoid. And he was able to restore those last 20 degrees of flexion that he wanted. Okay, switching gears now to synostosis. Um, here's a case, this is when Harry met Sally, and our case was when Galeazzi met Montesia. So this is an unusual uh, forearm injury with involvement of, of uh, the radius as well as a Montesia. And um, so this person, we fixed him with some plates, open reduction internal fixation, and uh, things went on to heal, but unfortunately he developed this synostosis proximally over here, as you can see and some calcification in the DRUJ. Here's uh, what a CT scan looks like showing the synostosis in the proximal radial ulna joint. And so um, the, the takedown of this synostosis was done through a posterior approach using his old incision. Uh, here in, in a triangle, you can see the anconius muscle has been exposed and then the anterior uh, window to get to the PIN. So here's the posterior interosseous nerve being exposed and protected and then this approach to the synostosis is done by finding the shaft and then just going right along the shaft, which keeps you safe and away from the PIN. And in most cases, you don't even need to expose the PIN. You can just stick to the shaft and come straight up, get to the radius. And the key to this procedure is to always put in a K-wire, make sure you're taking out the correct piece of bone and restore this look right here so that you have restored the PRUJ um, motion. So he, here he is now with the uh, restoration of elbow flexion extension and some forearm rotation. And uh, another case, this is another combination injury, only humeral dislocation uh, with a radial head fracture is a combination of a elbow dislocation and a montasia. And um, uh, Dr. Posner always taught me to start with an easy case to build up confidence. So we put a straight bone on a straight plate, straight plate on a straight bone. And then uh, did the radial head arthroplasty and fix the um, elbow dislocation with this uh, button to bring down the brachialis. Uh, and things went well, but he developed this heterotopic bone at six months and developed a an synostosis. So this forearm rotation that you see is all happening through carpal rotation. This is the carpus supination and pronation. It's not happening through his forearm. So the takedown here involved uh, identifying the posterior interosseous nerve. Here you can see the radial head and capitellum drawn out. And again, um, making sure to protect it, put in a K-wire to make sure in the right place and restoring this anatomy right here in the proximal radial ulna joint. And he had a good restoration of his uh, forearm rotation. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate your time. Dr. Okay. Paxima, thank you so much. That was a great talk on a really difficult, uh, difficult topic uh, that we often encounter. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit here. Dr. Virk, if you wanna start uh, sharing your screen. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Mandeep Virk. He is assistant professor in orthopedics in division of shoulder and elbow surgery. Um, and he is going to be talking to us about managing elbow instability, which we're getting some good questions already in the Q&A boxes. And I'd just invite my, my fellow panelists to jump in on, the, on, those, on those questions as well. Take it away, Dr. Virk. Thank you, Dr. Ailan, for a wonderful uh, introduction. Can you guys all hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Perfect. 
All right, so we all know that elbow is a complex synovial hinge joint, uh, which is highly congruous and inherently stable, but it also happens to be the second most common joint to be dislocated in the upper extremity. Elbow stability is provided by a fortress of primary and uh, secondary stabilizers. Uh, the ulnohumeral articulation, the anterior uh, bundle of the MCL and the LUCL are the primary stabilizers. And if these three structures are intact, the elbow is pretty much stable. If one or more of these structures are uh, deficient or disrupted, uh, the secondary stabilizers come into action and can partially or uh, completely compensate for the instability pattern. The secondary stabilizers include the radiohumeral articulation, the common extensor, the common flexor uh, musculature, and the capsule. Biomechanical experiments, including ligament sectioning and bone sectioning experiments in uh, cadavers, have really shed light on potential individual contribution of these structures. And in order to better understand the stability component of elbow, I'm going to go over these uh, experiments in uh, uh, a detailed form. So intact bony anatomy, especially the ulnohumeral articulation, is an important determinant of stability. The coronary process is the most important structure in ulnohumeral articulation and is the anterior and varus buttress of the elbow. Experiments have shown that loss of 50% of the coronoid height results in increased posterior instability on axial loading. Loss of more than five millimeters of antromedial coronoid results in increased internal rotation and elbow instability in, in varus loading. Sorry about that. So going, coming to the olecanon process, uh, which is equally important as uh, Dr. Paxima showed you a case where uh, 30 to 40% of the olecanon was removed. Uh, cadaveric experiments have shown that loss of more than 25% of proximal ulna results in reduced ability to resist various rotation. Loss of more than 50% is associated with reduced resistance to distraction and can result in vo a volar displacement of the ulna. We all know that radial head is a secondary stabilizer to valgus stress, which means that in an MCL deficient elbow, the radial head provides secondary stability to valgus stress. And if uh, radial head resection is present in form of like a comminuted fracture that is not replaced, it can result in internal rotation laxity and gross instability. The anterior and posterior capsule provide static restraint at terminal ranges of motion, especially the anterior capsule that provides resistance to joint distraction and hyperextension and valgus stress. Dr. Ailon went over the anatomy, but I'm just gonna briefly discuss this with respect to the stability component. Uh, the lateral ligament complex is the primary restraint to posterolateral instability and also provides resistance to various stress. It is composed of four ligaments of which the LUCL and RCL are uh, providing maximum contribution for restraint to varus and peak uh, posterolateral rotatory instability. Uh, also, uh, the humeral origin of uh, the lateral ligament complex uh, is uh, concentric with the flexion, extensors, flexion extension axis. So this ligament complex provides stability throughout the arc of motion. Uh, the medial ulnar collateral ligament complex is the primary restraint to valgus and postromedial instability. As Dr. Ilon said, that uh, the origin on the humeral side is slightly posterior to the flexion extension axis, which creates a cam effect. So a certain portion of the ligament is going to be active more during certain degrees of ranges of motion. So in conclusion, looking at these structures, the valgus stability and extension is equally contributed by the MUCL, the anterior capsule, and ulnohumeral articulation. Valgus stability and flexion is principally provided by the MUCL, and the secondary restraints include the radial head and the common flexor origin. Now, coming to the varus side, the primary restraint to varus instability and extension is the ulnohumeral articulation. The primary restraint to PLRI or posterolateral rotatory instability is the lateral ligament complex with contributions from the LUCL as well as the RCL. The secondary restraints include the common extensor muscles.
So elbow instability is a fascinating concept, but it can be confusing. There are multiple uh, fracture, uh, multiple instability classifications, uh, each with its own merits and demerits. I think majority of them uh, are based on the premise whether it is an acute or a chronic slash recurrent instability. Is it secondary to a soft tissue lesion versus a bone plus soft tissue deficiency? Then depending upon the direction and degree of displacement, these instabilities can be classified and also on the basis of the underlying mechanism of instability. So acute complex elbow instability, typically in post-traumatic setting, falls into one of the three categories, the posterolateral rotatory pattern, classical, classically described uh, under terrible triad, a postromedial rotatory pattern in which the anteromedial coronoid and the LCL complex is disrupted, and the transolecranon fracture dislocations. So when we look at elbow instability and we're thinking about acute post-traumatic instability, there are certain things which have been uh, observed by a number of investigators. Medial-sided ligament injuries are more common than the lateral-sided ligament injuries, but fortunately they heal well in presence of intact bony anatomy because gravity assists in healing. In contrast to them, the lateral-sided ligament injuries when present are exposed to gravitational stress throughout the rehab and they are better addressed with fixation along with bony fixation or reconstruction. The medial-sided bony deficiencies are less common and they are easily missed. If not treated with anatomic fixation, they can lead to incongruous joint and an early OA. So a couple of examples, 46-year-old male uh, fall on an outstretched hand. You can see here, uh, this gentleman has a trans olecranon fracture pattern, a comminuted olecranon, comminuted radial head, and an undisplaced anteromedial coronoid fracture that is well uh, visualized on a CAT scan. So based on uh, restoration of his stability, you know, we anatomically fixed his olecranon, had to replace the radial head given the degree of comminution, and we did the LUCL repair. The anteromedial coronoid fragment, as you can see here, was undisplaced and uh, was treated non-operatively, and it went on to heal well without any issues of instability. Classic terrible triad, uh, posterolateral uh, elbow dislocation, comminuted radial head fracture, type 1 coronoid fracture, LUCL disruption, as we all uh, know. Uh, we treated this one uh, with radial head uh, replacement. Uh, uh, we uh, treated the coronoid fracture non-operatively because it was very small, but the key part of the surgery is the LCL repair, which is the integral part of this procedure. So how do I do my LCL, L, L, uh, lateral complex uh, ligament repairs? Typically, the pathology that you see is a sleeve avulsion of the LCL from the humeral side, as shown in the picture at the bottom right. And in certain cases, uh, it can be an intrasubstance rupture as well with uh, injury to the overlying common extensor origin. So I typically uh, do these cases in supine position on a hand table. The striking uh, finding that you're going to see uh, in deep dissection will be the bald or bare lateral capitellum, as you can see here. Uh, once you're done with the coracoid fixation and radial head fixation versus replacement, I will put a double loaded suture anchor at the isometric point of the LCL complex on the lateral condyle which is very easily recognized. If you look at the front of the capitulum and back of the capitulum, the center of this, which is equidistant from the articular surfaces, is the isometric point. Uh, so out of those two suture lengths, out of those two sutures, a uh, pair of sutures, I will use one to run a Krakow locking stitch that runs on the inner surface of the capsular layer. The other uh, end of the suture serves as a post. If I'm doing a radial head replacement, I'll, uh, you know, prepare the uh, radius. Uh, I'll uh, do my trial of the implant. I may put the post in, but I will leave everything to be done once I have done my crackle stitches because it allows you to uh, get to the capsular side easily rather than putting the radial head and then you are left with very little room to pass those sutures. Uh, the second suture I use superficially for the extensor tendon repair in a similar fashion. So when uh, I have put in the radial head implant and I'm ready to tie the sutures, I typically do this in 30 degrees of flexion and pronation, but at the same time, I bring the shoulder uh, 
forward inflection so that I can have gravity assisted radial head reduction and uh, maximum pronation in order to get appropriate tension. So chronic instability is relatively less common. It is easily missed. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, and uh, it uh, uh, can fall into one of the three categories, the posterolateral rotatory instability, pure valgus instability, which is more common seen in overhead athletes, and various posteromedial rotatory instability. We will focus on that. Uh, this is the most common type of symptomatic instability, typically caused due to a traumatic injury to the LCL complex. There continues to be a debate uh, regarding the mechanism, whether it is a valgus hyperextension uh, versus valgus external rotation mechanism, as originally described by Dr. Sean O'Driscoll. Uh, it's a three-dimensional instability pattern, as you guys can see in these pictures. Uh, in this, the forearm, both the radius and ulna subluxate, away from trochlea uh, when axially loaded in supination. So not only the entire unit uh, uh, rotates externally, but also the radial head subluxate posterolaterally. Uh, the clinical presentation is commonly missed. Patients are often treated as uh, uh, elbow sprain or a tennis elbow. It does require a high degree of suspicion because the symptoms are, are very vague. Sometimes Patients can complain of locking and catching, but most of the time it's in form of pain and discomfort in the elbow whenever the elbow is loaded in supination or varus. Uh, the physical examination, there are uh, well-defined provocative maneuvers, and I'll uh, go over some of, the, uh, some of them in the examples, include uh, the test described here. And uh, imaging-wise, uh, plain radiographs uh, most of the time uh, do not show any major findings. Sometimes you can see a lateral epicondyle avulsion like uh, in this x-ray shown here. Uh, a widening of the radiocapitular space is also commonly seen. Very rarely a mild posterior uh, subluxation of the radial head as a static feature can be present. Stress radiographs are important intraoperatively to confirm the diagnosis. I do get MRI on all my patients where I suspect uh, PLRI. Uh, you can see mild posterior subluxation of the radial head attenuation of the uh, lateral ligament complex, and you can also see small osteochondral fragments as shown in this picture on the bottom far right, and other medial sided articular uh, injuries as well. So we're going to go over a case. Uh, this is a middle-aged or right-handed uh, dominant gentleman who has been complaining of elbow pain for past two to three years, does have a remote history of trauma, but does not necessarily remember if he had an elbow dislocation, does say that his elbow was placed in a splint and it did get stiff a uh, few degrees on either side for his motion. So this was his exam uh, uh, when awake, which basically is the uh, pivot shift test uh, in which on uh, axial loading of uh, the elbow and varus and supination results in uh, subluxation uh, of uh, the radius and ulna externally, which reduces somewhere in 30 to 40 degrees of uh, flexion as a clunk, which you guys just saw, and is pretty uh, uh, diagnostic for this condition. Most of the time, patients complain of apprehension, and you are not uh, really able to elicit this test in an awake patient. So in this gentleman, again, uh, there's a widening of the radiocapitular space. Uh, he had mild posterior subluxation on the MRI, attenuation of the radio a lateral ligament complex, but the radius and the ulna have maintained articulation and the medial side did not show any major arthritis. So uh, after discussing with this patient, uh, you know, surgical treatment was uh, selected to do these cases in a supine position on a hand table under a tourniquet. The graft of choice for me is palmaris or gracilis. Uh, I use a lateral coker approach as shown in this case. These are the pictures from this gentleman's uh, case. So in deep dissection, once you have gone through the superficial, the key is to go and identify the lateral supracondylar ridge. Uh, you elevate the triceps posteriorly along this ridge and distally develop this interval uh, into the ECU inconius uh, interval. You could lift the entire thing as a single layer or do it in uh, two separate windows, which is my preference of choice as shown here. Uh, once you uh, <clears throat> have developed these intervals uh, distally, you know, uh, we go down and uh, dissect the uh, supinator crest as shown here. 
Uh, the ulnar preparation is where I start first. I use a four millimeter burr to drill two holes. The proximal hole, the trick is it should be slightly distal to the proximal articular surface of the radius. I make this hole slightly dorsal. Uh, then I have a one centimeter bridge and I will make my distal hole, again, four millimeters more volar towards the uh, attachment of the radio ulnar joint. Uh, the two holes are connected with angular curettes and then you can pass shuttling sutures to uh, shuttle the graft uh, later on. After this, I make a radio ca a capitular uh, a capsulotomy. Uh, care should be taken not to uh, cut the annular ligament, which is critical here. Uh, then we determine the isometric point, just like we do the repair, as shown here. Uh, expose the anterior and posterior part of the capitellum and the distal articular surface, an equidistant point will determine that. When you use the burr, I usually will use a four millimeter burr and increase uh, the diameter to five millimeters or so. You want to sl start slightly volar so that when you put the graft, the graft is not posteriorly translated because you really want good tension in, uh, in this graft. After this, I will make two uh, separate drill holes, either using a two millimeter drill bit or a burr that connects from the posterior part of uh, the uh, uh, posterior part of the uh, lateral condyle connecting with the main drill hole. Pass the shuttling sutures and then you're ready uh, to uh, shuttle the graft. So again, I use the docking, tech, uh, docking method for uh, LUCL repair. The uh, graft is first passed through the ulnar tunnel. You do a whip stitch on one side, dunk that tendon into the tunnel, and then measure the appropriate length of the second limb, trim, pass another set of uh, whip stitch, and uh, shuttle it through the superior and inferior tunnel on the posterior part of the lateral condyle. So prior to pulling the sutures and docking them, I will uh, close the uh, radio capitular uh, capsulotomy, uh, pull these sutures and uh, tie them again in 30 to 45 degrees of flexion and maximum pronation. I again bring the uh, shoulder and forward flexion uh, over the chest so that I can have a gravity assisted radial head uh, reduction and maximum pronation allows uh, me to tension the graft well. Uh, again, a word of caution, sometimes, uh, you know, when we do the UCL reconstruction, we will make drill holes on the anterior and posterior part of the medial supracondral ridge because the medial supracondral ridge is really sturdy and you can tie over the ridge is not an issue. But on the lateral side, the bone is really soft. If you have drill holes on the front and the back and you tie uh, over a bridge on the lateral condyle, you can actually cut through that soft bone. So that's a word of caution. So again, uh, standard closure, I put these patients uh, in the splint uh, for two weeks, after which I transitioned them into a uh, uh, hinged elbow brace. Uh, 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 they have a restriction of shoulder abduction for good uh, eight to 10 weeks. I know Dr. Catalano is gonna go over the rehab of this elbow in his talk, and this is the gentleman after the repair. Uh, thank you very much. I did try to breathe through the slides. I hope it was not too fast. That was perfect, Dr. Virk, thank you. Um, that was a really enlightening talk on uh, a difficult topic. Um, okay, so uh, Dr. Hawkboard, if you wanna start sharing your, uh, your screen, we're now gonna be hearing from um, Dr. Jacques Hawkboard. He is assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Division of Hand Surgery here at NYU, as well as in the Department of Plastic Surgery. And he's co-chief of the hand surgery uh, surgis, service at uh, Bellevue Hospital and is co-director of the Center for Amputation Reconstruction at NYU. He's going to be talking to, to us about soft tissue coverage of the elbow, filling the gap. Take it away, Dr. Hockboard. Hey, thanks, Omri. Thank you, everyone. So this is a little bit of a change of topic for everyone. Sorry, I'm just trying to find my mouse and uh, I can't. So it might be a difficulty when I need to stop sharing my screen. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about elbow wounds. Um, I'm going to be focusing a little bit more about how to optimize coverage. And what I mean by that is not just showing you how to cover wounds, but how you can think about the whole, the whole um, wound from start to finish and how to minimize wounds uh, and to avoid wounds potentially. Okay, so this is obviously a pretty significant elbow wound, um, but this is not what we most commonly see. Uh, most commonly are wounds that are smaller, right over the tip of the olecranon. Uh, 
Uh, that's probably what you see much more often than the previous one. And so these are two excellent papers, and I'll come back to them in just a bit, um, both by Higgins and by Moran, whom I respect uh, significantly. Um, and so I, I recommend that you uh, look up these papers if you have any questions. But before we get to the specific algorithm of how to cover these wounds and what to use, we have to take a step back and we have to think, okay, how can I avoid even being in this situation, right? Because that's what we ultimately want, is we want to avoid these situations uh, much rather than how to know how to treat these situations. So avoiding elbow wounds, okay, so sometimes you can't avoid elbow wounds, but there are things that you can do to minimize the elbow wounds. Something that we don't think about in, uh, often enough is nutritional status of patients. Now, if it's a, if it's a traumatic patient, um, you don't have anything that you can do before the patient comes to the OR about the nutritional status. However, if it's an elective procedure or if it is a post-traumatic patient that is in the hospital, their nutritional status is essential. So you have to focus on that. You have to make sure that their pre-albumin is as optimized as it possibly can be. The next thing is tension. Um, wounds heal with significant difficulty and significant scarring if, if and when it's under a lot of tension. Uh, tension um, uh, also compromises the blood flow of a wound. And so all those things are incredibly important to minimize tension. Underlying hardware um, is a big uh, 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 source of increasing tension. So there are various companies that make lower profile implants and I recommend that you investigate those. Uh, another thing is the position of the elbow. Uh, if the elbow is brought into significant elbow flexion, then of course it puts a lot more tension on the posterior skin. But as we have heard from our previous speakers in the excellent talks, uh, the elbow is prone to stiffness. So you want to start moving the elbow right away. But if you're thinking about, okay, I have the potential of a wound or I have the potential of a stiff elbow, my recommendation is optimize the soft tissue. Because if you don't optimize the soft tissue and you have them start moving too quickly, what will happen is the soft tissue will be become compromised, you will develop a wound, which will then limit their motion. So in the long term, their motion will be affected more because you have this wound. So uh, avoiding a wound is the best thing that you can actually do for their flexion in the long term. Um, the closure uh, of the incision, I recommend uh, a non-absorbable suture, a 3-0 vertical mattress uh, rather than a horizontal mattress. Um, and something like an incisional wound vac can also be very helpful to do anything and everything that you can to decrease the tension of the wound. Another uh, suture that I find to be very helpful is a modified Algauer Donati suture, which is represented in the schematic to the right. Um, this is a deep dermal bite on the one side, and it is a vertical mattress on the other side. You place the vertical mattress portion on the skin that is the, uh, you believe to be the least compromised uh, with perfusion. Another very important feature about this suture is that you don't tie, you don't throw and tie sequentially. You throw all the sutures and you don't tie them. Once you've thrown all of them, then you pull all of them towards you to close the wound and then, then you tie them sequentially. That is a very, very important uh, feature when you use that suture. Okay, so you may have a wound. Um, what do you do now? You, you try to avoid everything that you possibly can, but you still have a wound. It is very important uh, that you look for disease, don't hope for wellness. This is one of my mentors from residency, um, Chip Brown. If anyone's ever had the, uh, the good fortune of meeting him, he can be a very intimidating person, but this is something that he ingrained in me and in all of my um, residency classmates is if you think there's a problem, don't avoid it. Uh, and really look and uh, look for the disease and treat the underlying disease. What I mean by that when it comes to elbow wounds is um, if you think there's going to be an elbow wound, if you think that, the, that something's going to um, not heal, don't try to avoid it. Don't stick your head in the sand and just try to treat conservatively until one day it finally is a big wound and then you're forced to deal with it. Because if you deal with it earlier on, it is better for the patient. It's a, it's a smaller wound, it's easier to deal with. So the first step of a wound is debridement. And if you Google debridement in Google Scholar, or at least advancements in debridement, you come up with a very, very short list of results. Debridement is 
arguably the least sexy part of any reconstructive surgery um, that you can think of. It is uh, one that people um, don't spend a lot of time or energy thinking about. You will hear people say the most senior person in the room should do the debridement, but the reality is that very seldom it happens. This is what we oftentimes think in the US of how debridement should be done. Multiple serial debridements every two to three days, uh, put a wound back on it, um, change the wound back at the bedside if you need to, or take the patient to the OR for the serial debridements. I strongly disagree with that. I strongly disagree with that. Um, our goal should not be multiple serial debridements. Our goal should be minimized debridements. Now, not to say that you will, you may not need multiple serial debridements, but your goal should not be multiple serial debridements. Also, do not put a wound back on a dirty bed. Only put a wound back on a very clean bed. It's very important. I can't stress that enough. So when you minimize debridements, you, you have less inflammation, you have a higher quality of remaining tissue, and you actually have a smaller wound. Another thing that's very important is that the patient is less decompensated. When a patient gets taken to the OR multiple times, their pre-albumin drops through the floor, they become physically and mentally decompensated. When you debreed, you cannot think of the coverage when you're doing the debridement. If you are the, the coverage surgeon, and you're the debridement surgeon, you have to compartmentalize those two. Your debridement mind has to be doing the debridement and not be thinking at all about what the coverage is. If you inadequately debride, you will have more complications. You will have worse uh, soft tissue coverage. So now you have the wound and now you think you're ready about uh, to start thinking about coverage. Um, but it is a the next step is, what is the critical area of the wound? The critical area of the wound are the white structures and the silver structures, the, the implants. These are the structures that cannot accept skin graft. These are the structures that need a flap. So it's a very large wound that you see to the right, but about half of it is critical. You have exposed plate, you have exposed radius, and you have exposed tendon. And then the other half is an excellent bed for skin graft. You have the reconstructive ladder, you start from simple and you go up. So now, now that we have a wound, and now that we begin to think about what the critical area of the wound is and the non-critical area of the wound, now we can start thinking about our coverage options. So the key flaps uh, that I think are um, the most useful, and there are many others that people have described, but these are, these are some of the key ones, is uh, the ankeneus to free flap, going up the, the reconstructive ladder. Of course, I've skipped um, I've skipped uh, skin graft um, because you know I don't need to tell you that skin graft is an option if you if it's a non-critical area of the wound you already know that. So beginning with the ankeneus, this is very helpful for wounds around the olecranon, uh, elevating the ankeneus, preserving its pedicle proximally, uh, and then being able to rotate it over the olecranon. So it's it's a larger muscle than we realize, but the wounds that it can cover are actually relatively small. So but it's it's very appropriately placed right over the olecranon or the wounds that it can cover, which is for the posterior elbow, that is the area that is the most commonly exposed. Other muscle flaps exist. The brachioradialis and the FCU are some of the two most common, but of course, like anything, like any flap, but especially the muscle flaps, you have to remember you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're taking a muscle and you're, and you're uh, uh, sectioning that you're cutting the tendon that it's going to, to where it's inserting, and now you're rotating it for coverage. So it's not an insignificant uh, procedure. The other thing about the muscle flaps is the muscle might be large. The ankeneus is not a big muscle, but it's bigger than you think. The brachioradialis is a very big muscle, and the FCU is, is a nicely sized muscle as well. However, when you rotate it, you are limited by the, the pedicle, and you're also um, limited by when you're rotating it, you only can use a portion of that muscle for coverage. So the amount of area that you can actually cover with these three muscles is very small. And that's something that you must take into consideration and think very carefully. Now, as you get larger wounds, uh, an anterograde grade radial form is a great option. Of course, there is the concern of sacrificing the radial artery, um, but this is, can be, this is a distally based radial form flap that is anterograde, so the radial artery flow is anterograde. You must have uh, intact palmar arch, of course, and then you can rotate it, and it's very good for elbow coverage anterior, anteriorly, laterally, 
and also posteriorly, not so much immediately because of the pedicle limiting you getting there. The lateral arm, especially the extended lateral arm, um, is an excellent flap as well if you have larger wounds um, and also if you don't want to sacrifice the radial artery. Um, so this is a, septocane, a, septo, a septocutaneous flap. Uh, it's based off of the posterior radial collateral artery, but it, you can also have an extended lateral arm. Um, the perfusion of the distal part of that uh, becomes a little bit tenuous, but you can really use that to rotate over um, and rotate anteriorly or posteriorly for coverage of uh, difficult and larger uh, elbow wounds. So this, this picture is also very similar to propeller flaps. Propeller flaps are a close cousin to the lateral arm flap and to the extended lateral arm flap because there are these perforators that are coming up from the posterior interosseous artery, uh, the radial collateral, um, the, the radial recurrent artery. Um, and if you doppler out that perforator, you can elevate that skin base off of that perforator and then move that skin uh, like a propeller to cover areas adjacent to that wound. So this wound is an example um, that might be amenable to, rather than a lateral arm flap, more of a propeller flap, if you can doppler out uh, perforators in that area um, that, uh, that uh, you can raise the skin and then uh, rotate into that wound. So very large wounds are most, uh, most commonly treated by the latissimus dorsi pedicled flap. You can have a uh, free latissimus dorsi, but here I'm specifically talking about the pedicled. And it can also be, uh, it can also function as a functional uh, flap, meaning that it can recreate um, the function lost by muscle that's lost. For instance, uh, elbow flexion can be recreated. So you can have coverage and also recreate elbow flexion or, or elbow extension. Um, so this is uh, several studies that list uh, the size of wounds that can be covered by the latissimus dorsi. Uh, it is limited by how distal, of course, if you do the pedicle, so about four to eight centimeters distal to the olecranon. Uh, so this is an anterior elbow defect, also absence of the biceps. And so you can elevate the latissimus dorsi, bring it in there. And so then you can recreate or you can reconstruct uh, the function of the biceps as well as uh, obtain good coverage. Uh, free flaps are less common, uh, but a free flap is also a very good option uh, for patients. And most of the time, these are fasciocutaneous flaps. You can use muscle flaps. But most of the time when you um, have a wound around the elbow, you many times have to return. Uh, and uh, for those reasons, a fasciocutaneous flap is better to, ele to elevate than a muscle flap. So I'm gonna just quickly go through this case. Uh, this is a case that shared to me today by Jared uh, Bookman. I thought it was an excellent case. So it's an, a pretty significant, um, very dirty, distal humerus that is um, a, a, a mangled distal humerus with bone loss. So uh, fortunately, the skin, they were able to close the skin. Uh, but as you can see to the left, there's a lot of uh, antib antibiotic cement beads in there because of the open nature and the loss of the distal humerus. So that skin, unfortunately, didn't make it. So that's flap skin that didn't survive. So pretty significant portion. Um, this so the image on the left is the hardware, as well as um, bone in there, uh, sorry, cement for uh, future masculine, so there's bone loss. Um, and what they did here was close, they were able to swing muscle over and skin graft over the muscle. Now, I think that this is a very interesting case, it's a very good case, they got good coverage and I don't, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to criticize after the fact, but what you really have to think about is we're gonna have to come back. We're gonna have to come back for potential significant HO, elbow stiffness, um, he has a bone loss, so he needs bone grafting. Um, and elevating muscle and skin graft isn't ideal. So you really have to think about what does the patient need in the long term for the elbow coverage. Because many times when you do this, you think just, okay, let's just get the, let's just get the soft tissue healed, let's get it closed. But you have to think of what will the patient need in the future, especially with the elbow, as we've heard, with stiffness and heterotopic ossification, hardware removal, hardware revision, uh, and bone grafting. So um, in summary, um, think about those things that you can do to avoid or minimize the wound. Acting early is very important for minimizing the wound. If you don't act early, then the wound will only get bigger. The, the, the amount of unhealthy tissue will grow. Um, and when you do have, and similarly, when you have that wound, Act aggressively, act with intent. 
Um, and then finally, think of the long term. Don't just think about what's going to be sufficient to cover the wound now. But you have to think about what will the patient need going forward in the future and what coverage do they need to maximize and optimize any procedures that they may need going forward. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. That was great. Uh, definitely makes us think twice about, you know, putting hardware in the elbow, what, what it could become. So uh, thank you for that important talk. Um, all right, Dr. Catalano, why don't you start sharing your screen? Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. This will be the last talk of the program this evening. Um, I'd like to present uh, Dr. Louis Catalano. Uh, he's clinical pr uh, professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Division of Hand Surgery here at NYU. And he's a direct director of the Hand Surgery Fellowship here at NYU as well. He's going to be talking to us about a often overlooked topic, I think, but is uh, just as important as the surgical uh, procedures that we do, and that's elbow therapy and splinting, what every hand surgeon should know. So take it away, Lou. Thanks, Armory. So I'm going to talk about uh, splinting and then instability and the treatment uh, rehab of that. So the, the bare minimum of elbow motion is 105 degrees of flexion and 40 degrees loss of extension. Um, I think if you have less than that, surgery is probably indicated. Um, it's really important not to improve extension at the expense of flexion. Essentially, flexion is a lot more difficult to compensate for. Um, people who lose elbow flexion have trouble shaving, putting their earrings in, um, reaching behind their back to do their hair. And the only thing you can do is flex your neck, which then gives you neck pain. Uh, in contrast, extension loss is pretty well compensated for by uh, knee, hip, and trunk flexion, or you just walk a little closer to the object you're reaching for. So that's pretty easy to, to deal with. It's flexion loss that's really uh, troublesome for activities of daily living. On examination, you want to check for two things, crepitus and tenderness. Just like wrist and uh, hand examinations, focal tenderness at the elbow is really important. You want to differentiate radial capitellar joint from lateral condyle tenderness. Um, so you really need to know your surface anatomy. Crepitus uh, indicates either a loose body, a joint incongruity, or synovitis within the joint. Um, this is one of the, the few joints that I use a goniometer for. Um, I think it's really important to measure, especially if you're going to do a release of the elbow, uh, to measure accurately both active and passive range of motion with a goniometer and make sure you reference it uh, throughout the perioperative period. Pains of a, at extreme flexion extension mean that you have impinging osteophytes, either from the olecranon or the coronoid. Uh, pain and crepitus within the mid ranges of motion means you either have arthritis, synovitis, or a loose body in the joint. And that's important to differentiate because that helps you determine what kind of surgery you're going to do. The initial treatment of any elbow injury or surgery is, as you can imagine, ice uh, elevation and compression. Um, as soon as possible, you want to start motion, essentially. Um, regarding CPM, some people advocate it. Uh, I've had issues with, number one, getting insurance authorization. Uh, number two, proper fitting. It always seems it's either too big or too small for the person's elbow. And if you fit them pre-op, then their elbow's a little swollen and the bandage makes it too tight post-op. And then there's the data. There's pretty good studies to show it doesn't make a difference if you use CPM or not. So I've recently not used CPM. Um, I know some of the, uh, the previous panelists showed pictures of the static extension splint. I think it was Dr. Paxima. I love this for a big elbow surgery or a total elbow. I splint them in extension for two to five days. You can hang them up so they don't get swollen uh, and it really helps the wound healing as well. So regarding motion, uh, restoration, you want to start active and gentle passive range of motion as soon as possible. Um, a little local heat helps stretching, uh, but you have to tell the therapist to avoid forceful passive stretching. Too forceful can increase pain and swelling and cause additional trauma and may lead to heterotopic ossification. And we've seen a bunch of x-rays of that already. Uh, I, the therapists know this, but it's important to let the patient know that when you're stretching out, you should count to 10 and the pain level should be about four to five out of 10. So once you reach four to five out of 10, you want to hold that stretch and count to 10. And the idea behind this is stress relaxation, which means lengthening of the tissue subjected to a load uh, below the elastic limit. 
Uh, regarding splinting, this is kind of standard for many hinge joints, but uh, the, the splints have to be carefully fitted in place by trained physical and occupational therapists. And if not, you may do more damage uh, than good. Uh, static splinting is helpful to maintain motion achieved during the day and during physical therapy. And static extension splinting can be used mainly at night if they're developing a flexion contracture. It's important not to limit flexion uh, with a splint though. Uh, there are so-called dynamic splinting, um, I'm sorry, uh, static progressive splinting or term buckle splints. Uh, this, these are, this is the kind of a classic picture. This is best used for flexion contractures of greater than 40 or less than 40 degrees. And essentially a static progressive splint uses some kind of ratchet or screw to increase uh, the stress across the elbow. Um, here's one made by our physical therapist here for a lady with a terrible triad. This is a, a, a basically a custom made static progressive extension splint. Uh, here's a recent patient who had a, a pretty bad distal humerus fracture. This is her uh, kind of off the shelf or jaw splint, static progressive splint. And here she is using it the other day. So twisted this way. Actually, she, this is as far as it goes in this setting. She's turning that, that dial to get more flexion. Here she is turning it to get extension. We're using it for flexion, but um, that's what she was doing to gain more flexion as well. Um, dynamic splints require spring tension or rubber bands to apply a constant force to stretch that joint. Um, it's best used for reach, recent contractures with soft endpoints. Uh, the problem is, is it hurts. Um, imagine someone you know, yanking on your elbow for 10 minutes. Um, it's poorly tolerated. Uh, they can use it for about 10 minutes, an hour. Obviously they can't use it at night, uh, but it's definitely effective uh, for recent contractures with soft endpoints. Uh, the physical therapy program usually lasts three months and I, I give people about six months of home therapy. Uh, and then at that point, um, usually active motion equals the hard passive endpoint. And when you reach that hard passive endpoint, you're really not gonna make, make much more progress as that hard endpoint represents non-compliant tissue that's not really gonna stretch out anymore. Um, at that point, once it's hard and the passive and active are the same, uh, you really need to either talk about surgery or just living with that degree of motion loss. So the previous splinting protocol was, is used for any hinge joint, you know, your PIP joint or your knee. Uh, but the real issue with the elbow is how do you rehab an elbow that's unstable or has been unstable and you fix the ligaments, try to make it stable. Um, and that, that's the real, I think the real quandary of, of elbow therapy. Um, and, and someone touched on this earlier, but varus stress is the problem. So varus stress taxes the lateral collateral ligaments. And anytime you lift your arm, meaning you open your armpit, um, you're stressing your lateral collateral ligaments. If you're heavy um, or you have big breasts, those, those, that tissue causes varus stress to the elbow. And usually that's not an issue, but when your elbow is unstable or you've recently done an LUCL reconstruction, that's a problem. So protecting varus is sometimes tough and if not impossible to protect against. Um, we mentioned that residual instability is very difficult to fix. And essentially this is my, my most um, biggest fear after fracture dislocations of any joint really is the LUCL, the elbow, making sure you keep that elbow reduced. Um, and uh, there are some really important points here that we're gonna cover. So the biggest pearl is supine overhead range of motion. And essentially you lay them supine and the elbow is moved overhead uh, and this is the best way to treat instability and get them moving soon. And it's used for either fracture dislocations or terrible triad injuries. Uh, you're using, and I'm gonna show you videos of this, but you're using active muscle forces, mainly the triceps, but some biceps. And those two muscles contribute to dynamic stability of the elbow, while the compressive forces uh, from gravity help stabilize the elbow as well. Uh, I, I work with one or two physical therapists and hand therapists uh, specifically when with these elbow injuries, uh, because this is really tricky therapy. And if they're not careful and the patient doesn't do what they're told, they can stretch out their repair and render their elbow unstable again. So here's a case that was done in August. This is a lady who fell and had a terrible triad injury. We've seen pictures of this already. So she is, you can see she's got a coronoid fracture. She has a radial head fracture, here's a radial head, here's a coronoid. And you can see her elbow is wide there. So um, 
this is a lateral, lateral approach. And um, as mentioned that you can see, this is the barrier, the lateral ligaments and the extensor mechanism rip right off of the lateral epicondyle. Uh, that's a pretty classic finding from a terrible triad injury. So I, I basically remove the radial head. You can see here's the uh, radial neck here is my flat radial neck cut. Uh, I like to fix coronoid fractures. So I put some sutures in these little pieces um, and brought them out through a drill hole. So here I am shuttling the suture through to the dorsal ulna. Then I replace the radial head. Um, you do not tie those sutures until the end, by the way. Um, you can see it's still a little gapped. So the elbow is obviously still unstable. I haven't fixed the lateral ligaments. Um, I believe strongly uh, that you should use drill holes in the, in the lateral column. So I make, uh, I use number five fiber wire in running lock fashion. Um, I use two of them. And one is through the Ankinius and the other one's to the ECU and EDC. Um, Dr. Verk mentioned that you really need to grab thick tissue because the ligaments lie on the inside of the tendon. So you need to grab the ligaments and the tendon. So your bites need to be full thickness with your suture. Um, and then as O'Driscoll taught us, you make a big drill hole in the lateral condo isometric point. Um, you drill usually with a three, five drill bit. And then you, I use a two, five drill bit out the front to the front of the anterior column and then a two, five drill bit to the back of the posterior column. And then I bring the two strands anteriorly, the two anterior strands anteriorly, the two posterior strands posteriorly. And then I tie, uh, again, I like to tie just like Dr. Verk does in some flexion and, um, and some varus stress, actually valgus stress. Um, so here's the elbow post-op. You can see it's reduced. There's no more gapping. Um, one mistake that a lot of people make, and I've done it, is you, you think, all right, this elbow's loose. I'm really concerned about the lateral ligaments. I'm going to put a big, heavy, long arm cast on to try to protect that joint as best I can. The problem is, is that's the worst thing you can do. And the reason being is the heavy plaster on the forearm pulls the forearm away from the elbow joints. In other words, you're stretching out your ligament repair with that heavy plaster cast. So it's counterintuitive, but you need the lightest thing you can. And the lightest thing you can put on the operating room is about 10 slabs of fiberglass. So I use a long arm splint of fiberglass in about 110 degrees of flexion and some pronation. Um, and that's the best thing you can do intraoperatively. To rehab these, uh, Aviva Wolf and Dr. Hotchkiss wrote a, a, kind of the seminal article on how to do this. Essentially, they, they talked about the um, importance of early protected varus eliminated therapy to help range of motion and bathe the articular surfaces with synovial fluid. And the key is to avoid that varus stress. Um, so no, no, um, you cannot bring the arm, you can't abduct it. When you're upright and you're heavy, you have varus stress. So by being supine um, and with gravity, you can really get the motion going. And here, here's, a, here's how you do this. So as soon as, uh, the patient can do this usually post up day three. I have them go to OT and they get a custom made long arm splint. You can see it here. It's in about 110 degrees of flexion or so. Pronation, the wrist is included to rest the forearm. And this is very light. So by being so light, you're not dragging uh, the forearm away from the elbow and pulling on your ligament repair. And essentially elbow flexion and pronation is the most stable position after the elbow has been unstable. And then you have them start OT. Um, so they start therapy with this overhead supine protocol. Um, this position is easier at first because it's easier for the patient to move their elbow up and down. And I'm going to show you what that means. So here's a video. Now, this is a little bit later on this lady. Um, but here's the, the best position to do this initially. So she's using her left arm to extend and help flex her arm. Um, her triceps is firing uh, to help stabilize the elbow and gravity and her bicep are helping flex it down. So you can, it's been shown, you can cut out the lateral and medial ligaments of the elbow and do this and the elbow doesn't dislocate. So she's doing flexion extension. Here she is doing pronosupination. So they do this initially. Um, just because it's easier for their left arm to help their right arm. Um, when they progress, you can see here she is about 10 days post-op. She's got the stereo strips on. Um, you can do it this way. And I think this way make, makes more sense. They're supine. 
the arm is adducted, so there's the elbow, the armpits closed, the shoulder cannot be internally rotated, and the arm cannot be abducted because that adds a vera stress to the elbow, and you can't have that. So in other words, the elbow is straight in line with the, the side of their body, and they start bending the elbow, um, flexing it up and down um, as, her, as she's doing here. You can see she's, she is, you know, say two weeks, 10 days out, and she's already got great flexion. Um, and that's gravity and biceps. And then her triceps is pushing her and she's already got pretty good extension for a terrible triad at 10 to 14 days. Um, you can see how she's pronated. Remember pronation makes the lateral side of the elbow tighter and hence more stable. That's why the splint and her exercises are done in pronation. Again, you can see her shoulders adducted. She cannot bring her arm up away from her body. I tell the patients, don't open your armpit. When you're opening your armpit, you're adding various stress to your elbow and you cannot do that. So around six weeks when the, the ligaments are healing, now you can start uh, doing a little bit more aggressive things. So here she is, she's forcibly extending her elbow with a bump to try to get more extension. Again, she's in pronation here to help stabilize her elbow. And again, that's pretty darn good flexion and extension. Um, and um, last thing you can do is use a bump to work on terminal extension. Uh, remember the elbow is most unstable in extensions. You probably don't wanna start doing uh, these strenuous terminal extension exercises for about two months until the ligaments are really healed. So thanks, I have some questions for the panel that I thought I was gonna ask because I don't know the answer to these and hopefully the panels, panelists can uh, help me. Um, I was wondering if anybody uses oral steroids or intraarticular steroid injections to help the elbow uh, loosen up. And then I had a question about, does anybody ever use manipulation under anesthesia like we do with the knee um, after significant elbow trauma? And last, uh, what about hinged elbow braces for instability? Uh, my answer to that is, I don't think you should use them. I, you, I think you need to use the, the static splint that's about 110 degrees of flexion and pronation as I showed you here. So Armour, do you care to take a stab at the top two questions here? Sure. I mean, I think um, I, I'm not opposed to using um, an intra-articular, uh, intra intra-operative intra dose of um, uh, dexamethasone um, to prevent contracture. However, I'm more focused on, um, if I'm really concerned about it, I would be more likely to use a, a dose of radiation after, after surgery. Um, I think that the data about indomethacin is not super uh, conclusive. Dr. Paxima, what do you think? I agree. You know, I, I'm always tempted to use the steroids, uh, as, as uh, Lou's brought it up a couple of times. I have not done it. Uh, I do use radiation. So typically, if, I'm, if I have someone who I'm concerned about, if I'm taking out HO, I'll book them for the HO and I'll book them for the HO uh, for the radiation the very next day. So I used to have to keep them overnight, but now you don't have to do that. You can do the HO as an outpatient and they can get the radiation the next day as an outpatient. I would add that the, um, the oral steroids, I think, are, have been shown by the guys at Duke to be very effective for terrible triad injuries. So like the lady that I just showed you, I gave her IV decadron intra-op and then a six-day steroid yeah. nedril dose pack post-op. And that was shown at Duke to be significantly uh, improved range of, range of motion after surgery. Yeah. So, that, so that's for an acute injury, not for HO prevention, of course. Right, right, right. I, I'm, I'm wondering, at a month later, does anybody ever give them steroids or a shot into the joint? I've never done that. But. I haven't either. It's funny that you say that because I just did that today for the first time. So uh, check in with me in a couple of weeks and I'll give you my NF1. Elbow one. stiffness? Yeah, elbow stiffness at uh, a month or six weeks after surgery. Right, it makes sense. I just never hear anybody doing it. Mm -hmm. and same thing with a manipulation under anesthesia. I mean, we do that for lots of joints, but I've never heard of anybody doing that for the elbow. I, I've done that for the elbow. I just did it recently too on a case. Um, it's a lady who had a distal radius fracture and a ipsilateral elbow dislocation and uh, <clears throat> ended up with a really stiff elbow at six weeks. Um, and, you know, perfect uh, skeletal architecture, but a super stiff elbow. And uh, so the, I ended up taking her to OR because she had... Uh, been fixed somewhere else. One of the screws was a little long on the uh, radius. I had to take it out. So when, when she got the block, I did a manip under anesthesia and just got all her whole range of motion back. So that was really 
really encouraging. But uh, I think uh, manipulation on the anesthesia has some limited role in the elbow as well. Yeah, so, think, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so for me, for manipulation, post-traumatic, uh, you know, if uh, within first six months, I think is the time after trauma where manipulation is going to work because uh, you are basically addressing intra-articular adhesions. Obviously, extra-articular adhesions are also benefited, but that's where you get that cracking noise and complete uh, f uh, restoration of range of motion. So I'll make sure if I'm taking an implant, I'll do it prior. The manipulation goes first, then I'll take the implant out. And uh, most of the times, uh, if not most of the times, if I've ever had to do it, it was for an olecranon, olecranon fracture. And I think around four months when the fracture was healed, I did manipulation and patient regained around 80% of the motion. And I took the plate out at that time. So piggybacking off of that, you know, we, we sometimes talk about the role of uh, radial head excision in elbow stiffness and HO. And so, um, you know, I'll ask you guys, ha, ha, you know, what role does radial head excision play in the treatment of um, elbow stiffness and, and HO in your mind? And how to, how to think about uh, which patient is the correct patient for radial head excision? Yeah, I don't, I don't hesitate to do that if, if there's a PREJ involvement and, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think that that helps a lot. Now, um, you've got to be careful in, uh, I, I try not to just do a radial head excision in acute trauma cases because I'm, I'm worried about SS depressive lesions, but it's unusual to get a uh, elbow instability um, <clears throat> after uh, HO release but you can get it. So I, I've done it in the cases like I showed where there was a significant loss of rotation. And I, unless it was a synostosis case where you could really get all this stuff out, then I think the radio head excision adds something to it. I would be careful to excise a radial head for a, post, a severe post-traumatic injury, even if it were a year or two later. I just, I would put a radio head plant in, in if I took it out. Yeah. How about that? You know, my, my two years later, someone developed a suppressive lesion after. Yeah, yeah. I would stick it back in. That's yeah. why if I'm excising it, I'll probably replace it. So for me, if the elbow is stiff, you know, which means that there is a capsular contracture, there's a ligamentous contracture, the chances of that elbow becoming unstable will happen only if the medial and lateral column ligaments are completely transected. If the bony anatomy is intact, I try to shy away unless there's a deformity. In an acute situation, you know, the things are different. In majority of the elbow dislocations, we know that uh, bearing few cases, uh, the MUCL is uh, torn. The LUCL may or may not be torn. So doing a radial head, uh, uh, you know, if it, the radial head is comminuted, not replacing, probably not a good idea. Not a good idea if there's an SX low press lesion, but uh, I think I have very limited indications to take the radial head in a stiff elbow, unless it's arthritic or deformed, or like Dr. Paxima said, the DRUJ uh, range of motion, sorry, not the DRUJ, but the proximal forearm rotation is an issue. That's when I will take it, but not replace at that time, because it even makes them more stiff in my hands. Shifting gears a little bit, I mean, a little along the lines of uh, instability, but uh, treating patients with global ligamentous laxity, you know, elsewhere in the body, you know, obviously the shoulder um, and even the hand and the wrist. Um, have you guys had any experience with ligamentously lax patients with frank instability of the elbow? And how do you approach those patients differently? Rehab, rehab, rehab. In my in my mind, <laughs> you know, and unless... if rehab fails again, rehab, rehab, rehab. So these are very unusual situations, uh, and I think uh, any kind of surgery, just like a multi-directional, is only gonna make things worse. In my mind. Um, okay, and I actually have a question for Dr. Hockford um, as well about. You, you, you talked about the nutritional uh, workup and, and pre-albumin in patients. And so how does that look in your practice? Are you referring a patient to a nutritionist? Um, uh, are you delaying surgery because of nutritional, uh, because of malnutrition? How does that look in your practice? 
Uh, so the majority of the time, these patients are already inpatient. Um, so if a patient were to come as an outpatient uh, with a wound, a uh, pretty sizable wound that needs coverage, um, then of course, yeah, you do that workup as an outpatient and if they have very poor nutrition, get them a nutrition consult. Um, but typically, um, uh, typically, like I said, they're typically inpatients and so you can get an inpatient uh, nutrition consult. Insurers have family bring them food from home have a high protein, high fat diet. Um, and the other thing is minimize, minimize in, uh, hospitalization. The more time a patient spends in the hospital, the more time they go to the operating room, the more decompensated they become. So it's really important to get the patients in and out quickly, get them treated, don't have them sitting around because as we all know, when you're in the hospital, you don't, you don't move, you don't, have, you don't generate appetite, the food is bad, uh, you get constipated, but you're not moving around. You're nauseated because of the medication and because you're constipated. Um, so all those factors accumulate. Understood. So now I understand you had a, a role in improving our hospital cafeteria over the past couple of years. You know, like actually, our... so you, we, had a, we had a patient um, during um, the past, the peak of COVID, and he, uh, he had a wound and we did a flap and you, know, we need, you told him like you need to eat well, but you wouldn't believe it. the hospital wouldn't allow family to bring in food from the outside. So here's a patient, here's a patient that did not like the hospital food. He needed high protein, high fat, and they would not allow family to bring in the food that he wanted. And so I'm thinking like, wow, we're really shooting you ourselves. <laughs> Omri, um, have we touched on what people use, if anything, for HO prophylaxis after acute distal humerus fractures? I mean, when, when do people use it? Do they use it all the time? If they do, what medicines do they use? So I, I don't use any radiation after a humerus fracture because, you know, the, it, there's a higher non-union rate. And uh, there, there was a study that basically had to stop that treatment in the middle because of the of the high non-union rate. So I think, you know, someone else asked the question earlier too, how do you prevent a show? Um, you, you know, who, typically who gets it is people who have, have had multiple manipulations. So it's it's the person who had a couple of reductions and they keep redislocating or they've had plate screws placed on somewhere else and you have to take it down and redo it. Uh, who gets it? But you really can't can't use atrial prophylaxis in the face of acute fractures because then the fracture won't heal. So that, that's that's the rub there, you know. So I, I agree. Second that, yeah. So I agree uh, with Dr. Paxima. No radiation for me. Uh, early on, I used to do endomethacin, and uh, later on, I realized I don't do these cases that many in a year, and I would forget putting people on endomethacin. So last three, four cases, got nobody got anything, and uh, here I am. I mean, yeah. I'm especially with those very distal, distal humerus fractures, I'm so concerned about the healing. I'd, I'd, I'd rather deal with a stiff elbow than a non-union. Right. The, the only time I use it, and I don't even know if it makes the difference, is if I see, you know, three or four weeks for the routine follow-up, if I start seeing a fair amount of HO around the elbow, then I'll give them some endomethacin if they can tolerate it, because mm -hmm. it's pretty hard on the GI tract. I don't, again, I don't know if that would change the natural history of it, but that's when I would use it. Yeah, I, I know, you know, the problem is, Lou, like, it's like you said, by the time you see it on x-ray, typically it's at the four to six week mark where calcium has deposited and such, and by then the cat's out of the bag. Right. So, um, well, if there's, if there's no other questions, um, you know, it's definitely past our bedtime here on the East Coast. Um, but I just wanted to um, thank all of our panelists um, you guys did re a really great job and we definitely learned a lot about managing these injuries in the elbow and uh, thank you to all the participants for coming and like I said log into the NYU CME site to get the actual credits from the course and um, look out for our next our next course which will probably be in in a few months so everyone take care thank have you. a good thank night thank you thank you thank you everybody